Now, have you ever wondered if big fish really do still eat small flies? I mean, a lot of us have read or heard that a wild stream bred trout can live several years just eating insects, but at a certain point, it needs to shift over to eating something a little more substantial. And that usually happens at about 14 inches. It would just expend too much energy for the calories it's bringing in if it just sat and ate bugs all day. So that's usually when they shift over to being more of a meat eater, eating other fish and, you know, animals like mice. But that's not to say that these bigger fish don't still eat the small bugs. And we think they do that for a couple reasons. First, if the bugs are just really plentiful or if it's just easy access to a quick meal. And from my experience and a lot of other folks out there from what I've read, one of the bugs that they still eat plenty of are these tiny little coronamid pupa. So what exactly is a coronamid? Well, it's a mosquito-like non-biting midge. Usually the adults are pretty small and then the pupa form of it it's this tiny little alien looking thing. Usually they're pretty dark and they've got that curve to them and a distinct segmentation. Some folks call them blood worms. Over in the UK, they call them buzzers, but here we pretty much just call them chronomid pupa, of which the zebra midge is one of the most popular ones. Now I did some quick research on the zebra midge and I saw one reference to it that said it was created by a guy named Ted Wellington from Arizona in 1996. Now that was the only reference I saw to who created this pattern. So I dug a little bit deeper and found out that in 1992, a guy named Kelly Davidson from British Columbia came up with another chronomid pupa he called the ice cream cone, which was also just a thread body with a thread rib and a white glass bead for the head. And I read that Davidson got his inspiration from a pattern created in the 1960s by a guy named Dick Thompson. Thompson was a fisheries biologist in Washington State. One day in the 1960s, he was fishing in a high mountain lake just south of Ephrata, Washington, when he saw a lot of fish rising but didn't see anything hatching. Couldn't get the fish to take any of his standard dry flies until he finally did catch one and checked his stomach and saw that it was full of some black and white striped pupa. So he goes back to his car and ties up the closest thing he can to imitate it, which was a black wool body with a silver rib and then a white tuft of ostrich for a head. The fly did great for him that day. He called it Thompson's Delectable Chronomid, or the TDC. So what I'm thinking is that this pattern Dick Thompson created in the 1960s was really the precursor to all the variants of the flies today that we call a chronomid pupa. And of those, probably my favorite is this one, the zebra midge. Now it's a really simple pattern. I typically tie it in three colors, usually dark. I'll do a black and a purple and a red. Uh, I will almost always have a, a lighter colored rib, either silver or gold, and then a silver or gold bead at the head. And sometimes I will occasionally put the slightest bit of crystal flash for the tail. If I'm fishing it on a bright day, I might want that. And some folks will tie it with a little bit of ostrich or peacock curl right behind the bead just to imitate the gills. But I usually don't go to all that trouble and tie the one that I'm about to show you right now. Now it's a really simple pattern and the fly can be super effective. In fact, the biggest fish I've caught out of the Savage River in my five years of fishing it came on a size 18 zebra midge. And another cool thing about the pattern, they're very dense, but not all that heavy. If you fish it on light enough tippet, you can hang it off of a pretty small dry fly. Lots of times I'll be fishing a number 16 elk hair caddis and then hang a number 18 zebra midge off of it. And it's not so heavy that it pulls my dry fly under. So this pattern, the zebra midge, super easy to tie, super effective. If you don't already fish this a lot, I hope you'll give it a shot. Well, there it is. One of the simplest patterns you can imagine. Plain old zebra midge. Obviously this one is a purple and I will tie this primarily in black, purple, and red. Now you have an option with your beads. This is a size 16. Well, you have an option with your hooks too pretty much curve shank hooks. This is size 16, it's actually a 1X short, hard to tell with that curve in it, but I will tie these mostly in 16s, 18s, and 20s, but I will keep the same bead size. That's a 2.0 millimeter bead. Now the very first thing I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of thread back behind here, really just to catch it in. I'm not trying to build up a whole lot of bulk just yet, but we got our thread caught in. Now we're gonna catch in the wire. And I usually use a silver, but silver or gold are gonna be fine in a size small. But here's a little tip. See, watch this, when you put it in, 
If you're not careful, you'll push it all the way through that bead, and if you're not paying attention, you'll end up with a little sharp point up there that might mess with your tippet. So what I do, I just fold the tip of it over, like that right there, and now it'll still fit in there, but it pretty much won't, um, you know, go through all the way. So I've just folded it back over a little bit, and now I can catch it in right here. And I'm going to take my thread all the way back to the, the full length of the body. And my goal here is to, wherever I caught that wire in, just keep it parallel to the hook all the way back. Okay, so that's about how long I'm going to want this one. Now, here's something else to keep in mind. Remember that every wrap of thread you put on the hook, you're putting a clockwise turn in your thread and your bobbin holder. So when we wrap 100 wraps or so, we're going to put 100 twists in this thread. And how I'm going to do this, I'm not going to worry about that right now, but how I'm going to build the bulk of, of my body and get a little taper, I'm going to wrap down a third and then back up to the bead, then down two thirds, then back up, then down all the way, and then back up. And then, you know, I will have corded that thread up quite a bit but then we'll flatten it out and smooth it out. So I'm gonna speed this part up and I'm gonna go down a third and up, et cetera, until I've built this, the taper on my body. Okay, now I don't know how many wraps that was, but it could have easily been 100. And you can tell that thread is very tightly corded up. So I'm going to give this a counterclockwise spin. You can see I nicked my thread right there. You see a little bit of that fuzz. Don't worry about that. Sometimes I like to teach people how to tie flies by showing them what not to do. That's a prime example right there, what not to do. So I've given my bobbin holder a huge, a big spin right there. So you can see that this thread is not corded up just enough yet. I'm gonna give it another spin right here. And when you're wrapping it, if your thread starts splaying out like that into a couple of different fibers, then you know you're pretty flat. So I'm gonna take it all the way back and just trying to smooth out this body, make it a little prettier right here. Just make sure you hit the point of your hook. That's always fun. And you might have to stop halfway and give it another counterclockwise spin if it starts cording back up on you. But for the most part, that's a pretty smooth body and I like that taper. Don't necessarily like where I've got that little fuzzy piece of thread hanging down right there, but hey, that happens. Now, really all you have to do is wrap this rib up here. Counter wrap it or wrap it normal, it doesn't really matter. My goal here is just evenly spaced wraps. I doubt that even matters to the fish anyway. But on this size, what did I say, 16? Yes, uh, probably a good six wraps or so to get up to, here to the bead. Okay, now when you get it up there, I'm just gonna catch it off a couple wraps behind it, a couple in front of it, and then maybe a couple more behind it just to really get this wire wrapped, caught in. Now when I've got it caught in pretty well, I'm just gonna helicopter it off and double check, make sure you didn't leave a nub right there. If you did, you'll just wanna spend a few extra loose wraps right here to help bury it. And there we go, I think our head is fine. I'm kinda of digging this rainbow bead right there. I like the looks of that. And I don't use head cement on this, so I just do two whip finishes. I'll do a three turn, and then maybe another three or four turn, depending on how much thread I want to build up. So I think that was a three, and let's do a, another three right there. I think that's gonna be just fine. So there you go, as simple as that. One of the most effective patterns you can imagine and certainly one of the simplest ones to tie. So that's it, my friends. I appreciate you watching. Y'all take care, and we'll see you next time.